You are listening to VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, you will hear reports from Brian Lynn and Gina Bennett. Later, Anna Mateo and Katie Weaver present the final part of our Early Literacy series. Finally, Katie and I tell you about some famous foods along Route 66. But first, a Japanese company is developing digital clones of individuals designed to take over some of a person's daily online duties. The company is Tokyo based Alt Incorporated. It is working on creating a digital double. An animated image that looks and talks just like its human owner. The company's chief executive, Kazutaka Yonakura, told the Associated Press he believes such a double could make people's lives easier by helping them get more things done. The digital clone, also called an avatar, Could be used for things like carrying out early job interviews or communicating with a person's doctor ahead of a medical visit. Yonakura said the main purpose of a digital double would be to liberate humans from the many daily duties. He showed AP reporters his own digital clone on a computer. It included an image and digitized version of his voice. When his digital clone was asked, What kind of music do you like? it waited several seconds before giving a long answer. The double explained that Yonakura favors lively music such as hip hop or rock and roll. Yonakura argues that the technology he is developing is more personal than other digital assistants, such as Apple's Siri, Amazon's Alexa, and Google Assistant. He said, most importantly, the clone belongs to you and not the technology company that created it. Yonakura added that his developers had attempted to build tools into the system that are designed to prevent awkward social mistakes. Currently, digital doubles are very costly. Each alt clone costs about $140,000, so it will likely take time before there is a mass market for the clones. Digital doubles are created by taking an individual's data from social media websites as well as publicly available records. The data is continuously changed and stored in the system. The data is designed to keep up with the individual's changing habits and activities. Yonakura said he believes a digital clone could open the door for a society in which people can center on being more creative and waste less time on necessary daily activities. The idea of a digital clone reportedly enjoys widespread appeal in Japan, the country that gave the world Pokemon, karaoke, Hello Kitty and emojis. But Yonakura admits that cultures are different, and Westerners may not like the idea as much. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, Why does it have to be a personal clone? 
and not just a digital agent. He said, I'm Brian Lynn. Researchers using information gathered by satellites say the loss of ice in Antarctica hurts the survival chances of rare seabirds. The large flightless birds are called emperor penguins. They raise their young in groups or colonies on ice that forms around the continent. The ice partly melts during the summer months. The British and French researchers studied satellite images to look at five breeding colonies of the birds in the area of the Bellingshausen Sea in 2022. They said the images showed no sea ice was left in December during the Southern Hemisphere's summer. This also happened in 2021, the researchers noted. The scientists said four of the five colonies they studied had been affected by early sea ice loss. Emperor penguin chicks are born on the ice in Antarctica that forms during the winter there. The ice is important because penguin chicks do not develop waterproof feathers for one to two months after they are born. Peter Fretwell is a researcher with the British Antarctic Survey who helped write the study. He said if the sea ice breaks up under them, the young chicks will drown. The scientists published their research in the journal Communications, Earth, and Environment. Fretwell's team also started a study of places where the penguins make their nests across Antarctica. They were able to identify the nesting places in satellite images because the birds' waste is darker than the surrounding snow. The scientists estimate that there are 300,000 breeding pairs of emperor penguins in Antarctica. The birds are the world's largest penguin. Fretwell told the Associated Press that 30% of the 62 known penguin colonies were hurt by low levels of sea ice. He said 13 colonies likely failed. Daniel Zitterbart studies Antarctica at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the state of Massachusetts. He was not involved in the study. But Zitterbart said he was not surprised by the results of the penguin study. He said that if penguins are not successful breeding in one place, they might look for another place next year. The population could recover. But Zitterbark noted, if you look further out down the line, how many suitable places will be left? I'm Gina Bennett.
next, we will hear the last part of our early literacy series. This story is all about comprehension. Before we listen, I have Anna Mateo here to talk a bit about the topic. Hi, Anna. Thanks for being here. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for inviting me. When it comes to learning a language, comprehension means to understand what we read. Is there more to it than that, though? Yes. Comprehension also means a learner can make connections between what they read and what they already know. Also, learners are able to think deeply about the content and also connect emotionally to it. How can a learner improve their comprehension skills? The story gives several strategies or methods of teaching comprehension. For example, learners can retell a story in their own words, or they can ask questions about the text. What about visual aids? As with other areas of literacy, such as vocabulary, using things such as word walls and story maps can help. These visuals allow the learner to see the language in a different way. How can a teacher or self-learner know when their comprehension skills are getting stronger? If a learner can guess what happens next or can retell a story in their own words, their comprehension skills are probably strong. Also, if they are able to change the story or use the lesson words in new ways, that also shows they understand the text. Well, thanks, Anna, for telling us a bit about comprehension. Now, here are Anna and Katie. When talking about literacy, comprehension means understanding what we read. On the website Reading Rockets, Literacy experts say, to be able to accurately understand written material, children need to be able to 1. Decode what they read. 2. Make connections between what they read and what they already know. And 3. Think deeply about what they have read. Strategies for Comprehension Ways of teaching are sometimes called strategies. Comprehension strategies should do some of the following. Teach students what they understand and what they do not. Teach the structure of a story, beginning, middle, and end. Teach students to retell a story or parts of a story. Teach students to ask questions about a text. Use visual organizers, such as word walls and story maps. Experts at Reading Rockets say teachers can show students the following skills. How to guess what is going to happen in a story. How to retell a story in their own words how to use new lesson words often and in different ways, how to ask themselves questions about a text as they read. These experts also suggest ways students can help themselves. A child can use visual aids such as outlines and maps. They can read with a friend and take turns summarizing. As they read, they can ask themselves questions about it. They can make mental pictures of the story. This strategy is called visualization, or a mind movie. Parents can talk about words, stories, and books with their children. Parents can also make connections between a child's experiences and what they read in a book. Strategy Story Map A Visual Aid 
Story maps allow students to learn the story in a visual way. Students must read carefully to fill in the map. Story maps also may be used for math, social studies, and science. There are different types of story maps. The most basic ones focus on the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story. More advanced story maps are about other story elements, such as characters, setting, problem, solution. Strategy Active Reading As you read a book to a child, talk about the story. This strategy turns a book into a lively conversation. Do not stop too much. If you do, the students may not understand the story. Keep it fun. Ask questions about the story. This will help the child get more involved in the story. For early learners, ask easy questions. You can point to a picture in the book and ask, what is this? For more advanced learners, you can ask more difficult questions. For example, what does this character want? When a student answers, give them feedback. That's right, the character is sad because he is lost. Add to what the student said. I was lost one time, and I felt really scared. Strategy Sequence Putting events in the correct order, or sequence, is a great way to understand a story. Why teach sequencing? It helps students of all levels to organize information. With beginning learners, you can use pictures, too. It teaches the structure of a story, beginning, middle, and end. This strategy also tests a student's ability to retell a story in order, or to summarize it. This strategy can be used with many kinds of writing. Students can sequence parts of a story or lines from a song or a poem. They can even sequence everyday activities, a math problem, or a recipe for making their favorite dish. Simply write or draw the text of a story or steps in a process. Then have students put the steps in order. Assessment for Comprehension There are many types of reading comprehension assessments. Generally speaking, if a learner cannot do the following, they may have a problem with comprehension. They cannot tell you the main idea. They cannot describe the characters or setting. They cannot explain a character's thoughts or feelings. They cannot connect a story to real life. They can tell you what happened in a story, but not why. They cannot retell the story in their own words. They cannot tell the events of the story in order. Apart from testing and assessment, experts suggest that teachers, parents, and caregivers should pay attention to the skills of describing, explaining, and connecting while reading with a child. Experts add that adults should pay attention to what a child says. Comprehension may be a problem if a child says, I couldn't follow the story, or simply, I don't get it. Use these tips, strategies, and assessment methods that best serve you and your learners. Change them to fit your students and teaching situation. I'm Ana Mateo. And I'm Katie Weaver.
In September of 2015, VOA Learning English traveled along the famous Route 66, the 3,900-kilometer-long highway stretches from Chicago, Illinois to Los Angeles, California. For the next two weeks, you will hear our reports from the road. We tell you about the communities, the people, the food, and the special landmarks that make up the highway that's the best. These stories first aired in late 2015. This week, we introduce you to some of the meals we shared along the Mother Road. Chicago, the eastern starting point of Route 66, is home to Deep Dish Pizza. Chicago Deep Dish is very different from pizzas in other American cities. And it could just be the richest, cheesiest, and most satisfying pizza around. It starts with a round cooking pan, between 5 and 8 centimeters deep. Then comes the pizza dough. The dough is usually made of wheat flour and some butter or oil. That helps make a thicker and sweeter crust. For Chicago deep dish, the dough is spread up and around the side of the pan. Next, the pizza maker fills up that bowl of dough. First comes the cheese and plenty of it. Then any meat or vegetables go on top of the cheese. The final step is tomato sauce. Unlike most pizzas, the sauce goes on top of Chicago deep dish. Deep dish pizza takes much longer to bake than flat pizza, but it is worth the wait. Springfield, Illinois is known as the home of Abraham Lincoln, but it is also known as the home of one very hearty meal, the horseshoe. Many decades ago, local railroad workers in Springfield would go to small diners to eat late at night. The cooks gave them a mix of everything that was left in the kitchen. That included ingredients like bread, meat, potatoes, and cheese. A horseshoe starts with a big, thick piece of bread called Texas toast. A piece of meat goes on top of the bread. Diners can choose between beef, pork, chicken, and even fried fish. On top of the meat is a very large pile of french fries. And on top of the fries, a lot of cheesy sauce. A real horseshoe is a piece of iron attached to the bottom of a horse's hoof. At Darcy's Pub in Springfield, Our server told us just how the meal got its name. She said the french fries represent the nails in a horseshoe, and the thick piece of bread represents the horse's hoof. Cafes and restaurants in Springfield and other cities serve horseshoes all day long, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Whatever time of day you eat it, A horseshoe will probably keep you full for many, many hours. Santa Fe, New Mexico is home to many cultures. And that diversity is reflected in its food. A mix of Mexican, Spanish, and Pueblo Native American cuisine. In most cafes around town, you'll find mole on the menu. 
Mole is a sauce used in many New Mexican dishes. There are many different kinds of mole. But in this part of the world, the most famous is mole poblano. One of the best places to try it is at the friendly Plaza Cafe. It is the city's oldest restaurant and right next to Santa Fe's main square. In the main square, we talked to an unofficial expert on mole. Rick McGuire was visiting from Tempe, Arizona. He is a big fan of mole. Mole is a mixture of chocolate and about 20 to 27 different spices that they put together. And it's got some chili in it. Uh, some mole can be a little spicier depending on how much of the chili part they put in there. The thick brown sauce is not sweet. The chocolate gives it a sort of smoky flavor. Mole is usually used in chicken and pork dishes. Rick McGuire says it was once only eaten by Mexico's elite. Chocolate was invented in this part of the world. That's where the cocoa plant is from. And the chocolate was actually considered for the high end, you know, the priest and things like that. With its rich flavor, it is easy to understand why mole was once the food of priests. Irv's Burgers has served Route 66 travelers and Hollywood locals since 1950. Actually, it was not always Irv's. It first opened in 1950 as Queenie's Burgers. Then it changed to Joe's Burgers. It became Irv's Burgers in the early 1970s when Irv Jindis bought the business. The original Irv owned it until 2000. That year, a Korean-American family bought Irv's Burgers. The Hongs, Sonia, Sean, and Mama Hong, have served up simple, fresh burgers and fries on paper plates for 15 years. They write personal messages on the plates for each customer, and the Hongs know many customers by name. The Hongs have had to fight to keep the burger stand open, and devoted Hollywood locals have helped them in that fight to keep this Route 66 gem in business. Irv's did close briefly, but it reopened in a new location in 2014. They have settled in just fine. The phone at Irv's rings nonstop, with customers calling ahead to place their orders. During lunchtime, the line spills out of the tiny restaurant. The menu at Irv's is not very long, but the taste and quality of the food brings people back again and again. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Katie Weaver. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.